like to introduce our, our first speaker, Dr Hugh Finn from the Curtin Law School, uh, and, and we'll take questions after uh, Hugh and Tim have spoken. Um, Hugh completed his PhD in Biological Sciences at Murdoch University in 2005 on the conservation biology of bottlenose dolphins around Perth. He currently lectures at the Curtin Law School in Constitutional Law, Administrative Law and Environmental Law and Policy and it is, is a member of the Sustainability in Business and Law Initiative in the faculty. He worked previously in research and academic roles at Murdoch University as a coordinator for a citizen science project at BirdLife Australia and as an associate in the Supreme Court of Western Australia. Hugh's research interests are in environmental law and policy and legal reasoning with a focus on legal and policy frameworks for climate change and wildlife conservation. Hugh was chairperson of the WA Defend Environmental Defenders Office uh, in 2019-2020 uh, before, um, before the EDOs all, all merged. So um, Hugh's uh, uh, speaking on um, advocating for the value of urban bushland and describing the legal concepts and principles relating to urban bushland. Hugh Finn. Thanks so much, Christine. And um, thanks so much to, to you all. So it was really wonderful. It's a great privilege to, to be here today and to speak to you all. Um, and listening to, to Sonia and Robin and Leslie and Steve, each of you working with the, your local bushlands or bushlands plural, um, and have many of you for a long, long time. So it's a, it's a really wonderful opportunity to, to be here with you all today and, and, um, and to, to work together as a community of practice. Um, and I think that's just like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of where we are in Hurin Bolu, the Wajok people of the Noongar Nation, and the indigenous elders, custodians, their descendants, and kin of this land, past and present. And so, thanks to, to um, Christine, Coma, Mary, Mark, um, everyone in the Urban Bushland Council for the work that they do day in and day out, 365 days of the year and, and for decades. So um, it's really fantastic. And all of you in the individual organizations that um, are working together. And, oops, go back one. And so we are a community of practice. And that's really here to you, talking to you in that capacity as part of this community of practice because we're all advocating for local bushland um, and we're trying to persuade and to get better decisions um, which is a lot of what we do along with many of you also doing on the ground restoration work as well so it's a combination of things we do but the one of the purposes for today's workshop is how we can think about how we persuade and at a broad level just wanted to talk to you a little bit about the EP Act I guess mine I was talking with Tim um, my talk will be a little bit aspirational in terms of sort of trying to look a bigger picture of what's in the EP Act and I guess where we're going with our advocacy and trying to pick up some ideas. Um, all of us have a sense of the value for our local bushlands, but some other ideas and ways we might think and, and integrate into our advocacy um, and so we can be more effective. And it really is often about the value that we attach and, and trying to express and articulate the value of those local bushlands. So hopefully, um, and the slides, the, some of them have links in there, so they'll be available available to you. Um, I'm happy for them to go out to you all after the workshop so you can use those links and um, if you have any questions please feel free to contact us. I'm happy to happy to chat about it. Oh, Steve? Can we also have a copy of your presentation? Oh yes, definitely. No, I think I think that'll probably go up on the on the website and yeah, it's happy and all the links will be in there and if you have any questions please feel free to, to ask us. Um, so I won't, um, just to point out, um, won't sort of list off all the values of wood, uh, our bushland. Many of you are obviously aware of those and, and both the sort of scientific and aesthetic and cultural, however you want to put value on. Um, and obviously they're in these documents as well. Um, and they're in even in the EP Act. So I think everyone's got a copy and you can see some of the values are expressed in the Schedule 5 principles. Um, but they're not comprehensive uh, in some sense. And some of the values that I'll talk today aren't in those Schedule 5 principles. And I guess one of the things is to encourage us to thinking about how we can also look more broadly and have a um, discussion about how we value our um, native bushlands. So two parts to the talk. Um, first part, I'm just going to talk about really the, how the Act defines environment um, and pick out some parts of that and different ways in which we can advocate for the values of bushland. So you all got the um, Section 4A um, provides that the object of the EP Act is to protect the environment of the state having regard to the principles there. And I won't list off the principles. Um, some of them be quite familiar to you. Some of them are more sort of in relation to waste and pollution. Um, 
and I'll talk a little bit um, about some of these principles, um, but also that the content of these principles has to be contemporized to where we're at today. So we have a changing climate, for example, um, and we're continuing to experience the ongoing deforestation of the Swan Coast Plain in terms of our Bankshire woodlands and Chuart woodlands. And that needs to infuse how we think about the precautionary principle and the content of intergenerational equity so future generations can enjoy um, the woodlands and forests. We have at least the quality today. Um, and if you if we actually implement what's said in the um, native vegetation policy, we actually need a net gain landscape. So we have actually more vegetation on our landscape in the coming decades. The, in terms of the EPA, um, Section 15 provides that the object to the EPA to use its best endeavors to protect the environment and then to prevent control and abate pollution and environmental harm. So those are just sort of, you know, loyally statutory words, but they give a sense, and I really wanted to focus on that word environment. Um, and so it's defined for the purposes of the EP Act, and those, you know, um, there are different ways of defining environment. This is how the Act did it. Uh, living things, their physical, biological, and social surroundings, and interactions between all of these. And the first part of the talk, I'm just going to pick out some of the parts of that, um, and I'm sort of going to talk about four different things. So I'm going to talk about public health, I'm going to talk about wild animal welfare, talk about relationships, and then talk about protecting the environment in a changing climate. And so the first one, basic point to you, um, many of you working and familiar with this time, but that bushland native vegetation is public health. Um, that the, this is something that Common Lawrence and others have been working in this area a long, long time. Um, and so there's a lot of great resources. I've put it a couple in a few slides time. But it is really important that we begin, I think, to, to talk about the public health value of native vegetation. So urban forests as well, um, but bushlands have this um, positive public health aspect. And more than that, when we lose those local bushlands, that impacts upon public health. And that's a critical thing that needs to be in the decision making and considered as a value. Um, and so if you want to look at the EP Act, um, that definition of the EP Act is living things, their physical, biological, and social surroundings. And then the Act says that the social surroundings are aesthetic, cultural, but the relevant words there are affected by the physical or biological surroundings. So the point I wanted to make with that, the Act actually talks about how we are and our culture and our well-being is affected by our physical and biological environment and, for example, our local bushland. So that's the in there and how the Act actually talks about the environment. And so make another connection to another statute um, that is to emphasize this point that public health means the health of individuals in the context of the wider health and well-being of the community. And then I actually think that we can talk about local, keeping local bushland and maintaining as part of this combination of safeguard policies and programs. Because it's well demonstrated now, the public health, you know, the, the psychological and physical benefits of being in nature, having local bushland around us, having an urban forest. Those are things that are measurable, quantifiable from a, you know, empirical things from a scientific perspective, um, but they are public health benefits of local bushland. So this is another way we can talk about the value of our local bushland. Um, and I'm not saying that the preserving public, um, public, a local bushland is part of this general public health duty, but I am saying that this new act, this public health act, and how we think about public health um, you know, the way it includes mental health uh, much more than it ever did before, that we actually, you know, having nature next to us, living within it, having a connection to it, relating to it, these are important, measurable things that improve public health for individuals and for the communities in those areas. So these are some resources, um, Pierre Horwitz and Carmen Lawrence and others, um, and relevantly there's a chapter from the Never Again, since we're dealing with the Row 8 and Row 9 again, um, but it's a chapter um, about that and it's got some uh, relevant content and if you're needing further information, I'm happy to sort of put you in the right direction. The next one I'm going to talk about is wild animal welfare, um, and so that this is something that rarely figures into decision making, but when you clear a bit of bushland, it impacts upon the animals that have that as their home. Uh, many of the animals are killed when the actual vegetation is removed, and other animals, um, they may disperse for a period of time, um, but effectively they're put into harm's way. So we saw that, you know, you see that when the clearing of, of vegetation and the animals are hit trying to cross the road to get into bushland somewhere else. 
And so this is ways that we can articulate this if you want to think about it. Um, when you're actually removing the vegetation, these are the kinds of things that can happen. And then often the vegetation itself is burnt um, at the end of it um, after being removed. Um, and that second one, just the, the exposure, the putting in harm's way. So a couple resources there to think about. There's a conversation article and then um, there's a paper there. Um, so I was one of the authors, but um, along with Nahid Stevens, but um, it's a, something that I think is quite important to, to talk about in terms of the, the bushlands are home for lots of native animals, um, as well as the, the plants that are there. So the third one to talk about is relationships. And so this is encapsulated in the idea of interactions, which, you know, from a scientific perspective, we all know about the interactions between the, you know, the different components of ecosystems and communities. But I just wanted to point out that, you know, we, um, I think Steve mentioned the, the native vegetation policy, which, which has good things in it. But it, it mentions the word relationships once. Um, and that's in the context of the acknowledgement of the traditional owners of lands, waters, and skies um, in this state. And I just, I just think that's really odd because um, we all have relationships with land and it's incredibly important and local bushland. And it just that we have as a, you know, the, the highest level statement of the value of native vegetation in our state and it doesn't talk about relationships at all. Um, and this is something from First Nations. Um, fundamentally, um, First Nations are, uh, you know, they're talking about their uh, culture is b based around relationships with particular country. Um, and it just, and many non-First Nations um, communities and individuals also have these long-standing relationships with land, with local bushlands. And it's just, we need to be having these conversations about that we're not just isolated little islands that go around unconnected to things. Um, and that we have relationships with land. The land is a part of us, um, and that needs to be part of our discussion. Um, and so, it makes a bit of a segue that this is also the part of the work of reconciliation. So this is a quote from uh, Chief Justice Quinlan, um, the current Chief Justice of the Supreme Court of Western Australia, was talking about the um, Uluru Statement from the Heart. Um, and I'll give the words, the relevant words from the Uluru Statement from the Heart. But, you know, this is a concept that is in law as well, um, as, a, as well as in culture, this idea of relationality and that we have connections and that actually what defines us is our connections and kinship with other things. And these are important things to articulate and to think about in terms of the value of our local bushland. And so this is the very beginning of the Uluru Statement. It goes on after this. Um, but this idea of sovereignty, of connection to the land. Um, and these are important, uh, important concepts articulated by First Nations in the Uluru Statement from the heart, but relevant to all of us and relevant to how we think and value um, our local bushlands. So the last of the um, fourth part here, the first sort of part of the talk, is to talk about protecting the environment in a changing climate. And changing, using the ING, is to indicate that we are talking about something which is ongoing, which is intensifying. Um, we can see that over what's happening in the East Coast. Um, still much of um, a third to a half of Pakistan is still underwater. So countries around the world, people's communities, are experiencing the effects of climate change, and native vegetation is as well. And so these are just um, some basic points about, you know, trying to protect the environment and trying to uh, look after our local bushlands in, in the context and also relevant for decision making that occurs in the context of a changing climate. So that climate change, it creates and amplifies the um, uncertainty. So to use one definition for risk, um, risk is the effect of uncertainty on your objectives. So, you know, for example, if we're trying to create a net gain of vegetation on our landscape, we have to take into account the fact that um, climate change is going to continue and indeed even to intensify its impacts upon groundwater, um, causing tr uh, drought, heat waves, all of those things that are impacting upon the ability of native vegetation to persist and where we're trying to revegetate, whether that's rehabilitation or some kind of offset or just trying to um, to add to the quality of our local bushlands, climate change is something we need to take into account. As well, we know that like, what things with forest disease, plant disease, um, and other threatening processes, um, climate change amplifies the impact of those and interacts with those other threatening processes. 
It also, in an important way, constrains what can be practically achieved. Um, so recently we've been talking about this and looking about mine site rehabilitation in the Jera Mary Forest, particularly the northern Jera Mary Forest, and climate change and all of the sort of consequent effects of declining rainfall um, and other consequences. They really constrain um, you know, what can be achieved with when you knock over a forest and try and replace it. Um, in a changing climate, you're just not going to get close to what was there before. Um, and that needs to be, you know, on the Swan Coastal Plain when we're talking about offsets um, and trying to revegetate areas. Obviously, I support revegetation, but we need to be, you know, particularly when we're talking about offsets, where we'll knock over this bit of bushland and we'll plant more over here. Um, there is a practical constraint on what we can achieve in terms of revegetation. It needs to be done smartly. And I think getting to the um, fourth point there, climate change. Um, it increases the value of keeping intact what we have and trying to keep it in the best quality we can. And that also makes sense from um, a climate change perspective because although we talk about getting to net zero like it's something in the future, actually um, we're trying to get back to net zero because um, this landscape was sustainably managed for many centuries, millennia, um, as net zero or as a net carbon sink. And so it's actually a case of thinking about the intact native vegetation we have in our local bushlands is actually a great long-term storage uh, for carbon um, if we keep it that way. And if we mobilize it, we clear it, we let the carbon up into the atmosphere, it'll be up there for a long time, um, regardless of how we try and go about getting it out, back out of the atmosphere. You know, same thing for fossil fuels. The best way, the best carbon security is the long-term storage, keeping it in the ground as gas, coal, and oil. Um, so just thinking about these things in a changing climate. Um, and it's important to articulate these things because I think I'll try and talk later. It actually changes the content of how we think about trying to preserve um, our look, what we're trying to do when we think about the contents of what co biological diversity is or when we talk about what's comprehensive, adequate, and representative, you know, what was comprehensive, adequate, and representative 20 years ago is not so today. And that needs to actually, we need to our policies and decision making to update to take that into account. Um, and so um, I'll, I won't read these off. Um, they'll, they'll be there in the slides for you. But we're, the point I really meet, wanted to make here is that we actually we need to tell decision makers, you actually need to change the way you go about your decisions to think, to realize you're making decisions with landscapes that are experiencing climate change and likely to have intensifying impacts of climate change into the future. Um, and we can't keep making decisions that are back in sort of 2000s, 1990s thinking. We actually need to update where we're at today and the trajectory we have in terms of climate change. And so I think this changes all elements of, of not only how the EPA uh, makes their decision making, but local governments, um, the Department of Water and Environmental Regulation as well. So there's some thoughts, uh, thoughts here. They go over onto this next slide, um, but really the basal point there is just encouraging decision makers, look, we're in a changing climate, you know, what's acceptable, what's reasonable, what's consistent, what's seriously at variance, what's adequate, um, actually has to take on a content that reflects the changing climate we're in. And getting back to those points I met earlier, I think it really does emphasize the value of keeping what we have intact um, is an important one. Um, and there's some more information there as a resource. Uh, it's a submission the Belio group put together, but talks about how the sort of decision making can, can or should really ought to change in the face of the changing climate. So that's the, the first part of the talk. And really there, I was trying to talk about some different ways of thinking about the value of our um, native bushland. And I guess trying to, to think and, and um, ways in which we might, um, in addition to all the other ways we articulate and talk about the value of our local bushlands, some other ways with the health and changing climate, to talk about the animals like Kerry cockatoo that live in those wet, uh, woodlands, um, and uh, those other factors. So this one, I'm going to really talk about the EP Act, and um, I will probably be a bit aspirational in thinking about the EP Act. Um, and Tim, I think, in his talk will sort of bring us back to the more pragmatic view of it. But, but I think it's important because it's likely to be the foundation that we're going to have going forward um, and that we can use it as a resource. Um, and there are things in it that we can reference uh, when we do our, our advocacy. So many of you are quite familiar with the Act, but in terms of native vegetation and local bushlands, 
We have um, part four deals with environmental impact assessment, and that's really the function of the EPA uh, among their other functions. And then part five deals with clearing permits, the clearing of native vegetation. Um, and I guess the point, and it's kind of normative, it's kind of a lawyer's word, but you know, if you look at the Act, it's actually quite a strong normative framework for the protection of uh, native vegetation. Um, and some of the elements in there that, you know, that there are proposals, if they have a significant or are likely to have a significant um, effect on the environment, then they must be referred or they um, must be, or they will be assessed by the EPA. And so that's a whole part four process, prohibition um, on the clearing of native vegetation. Um, and I can look at Mary and say, there's a, you know, you can drive a bus through the exemptions and, and the like. And that's very true. And that's something we need to, um, to work on going forward. But there is that basal prohibition. Um, and it's a very strong public statement as to the social by Parliament about the social value of native vegetation. And likewise, as incomplete and perhaps, um, you know, needing refining as those principles are in Schedule 5, they are an important statement by Parliament um, about the value of native vegetation. Um, and I say that so it does provide this important normative framework. And by norms, I mean legal rules and principles. Um, and that's sort of, you know, lawyers like to talk about these things. But, um, but it is important that we look at the EP Act in this way, because I think we can leverage uh, some things from it. And that's where I'm trying to try and go in the rest of the talk. Um, because you can look elsewhere and as, you know, uh, imperfect and as needing improvement as are many of the policies, local government and state government policies that we have, they often have little things in them that are quite useful. Um, for example, the state planning policy 2.8, which, you know, was back, made back in the noughties and definitely, uh, you know, the 2000s, um, definitely needs to be updated. Um, but it has these presumptions in there. Um, about the um, clearing of native vegetation in bush forever areas and all areas of bushland outside bush forever areas. And a lot of local governments have biodiversity strategies or policies <coughs> relating to local bushland, um, which um, either expressly or impliedly have this kind of presumption against the, the clearing of native vegetation. Um, and talked about the native vegetation policy, but, you know, this is potentially, and we'll see what the implementation of this document actually looks like, but potentially it is very important because it articulates this idea of a net gain at a landscape scale. And it specifically, you know, as almost a footnote, but it's in there, um, talks about the Swan Coastal Plain um, and the need for strategic coordination and stewardship across sectors to restore landscape and ecosystem function. But, you know, for whatever it is and for whatever its limits are, it is a statement about trying to look at the Swan Coastal Plain and actually have a net gain at a landscape level. How that happens um, and you, the, the, the comments I meant earlier about, you know, needing to be realistic about the constraints upon revegetation, where we can do it, fantastic, um, but it needs to be done well. Um, and it'll also in the context, we can't have a say, well, we're going to get all of our net gain from offsets um, because actually we need to keep what we have and add to the quality of what we have. Um, but it is an important statement and, you know, a space to keep looking at in terms of what the implementation looks like. But I think what we get is we get these presumptions against, we get three presumptions. We get presumptions against the clearing of a local bushland area. They're imperfect, they're limited, they have exemptions, they have exclusions and all of those things, but they're there, they're a starting point. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about them again. The second one I want it to talk about, I think really follows from that net gain that we actually now have a presumption against deforestation. You know, globally this is accepted, but why do we think any differently for the Swan Coastal Plain? We have deforestation going on here and we need to be, um, we need to be express about that. And also, um, we have a presumption for net gain. Now, the policy says not to be applied at the level of an individual proposal, but how do you get to a net gain without looking at individual losses and individual applications for clearing? You just can't get there. So we need to be smarter about cumulative impacts, looking at the landscape holistically. And really, I think one of the things we can do on advocacy is try and identify where these presumptions are. You know, they caveat that they have these limits around them, but we can look to strengthen them, we can look to revise them, we can look to extend them, and we can look to entrench them. 
So they're a great point, um, and why that's important I'll get to in just a moment, um, because I think we can also start linking these together so we can be smarter about how we look at cumulative impacts, how we apply the precautionary principle. So I won't go into it at the moment, but um, there was an article in the most recent, the spring 2022, about the precautionary principle and how it might apply to our thinking. So there are ways we can try and encourage decision makers um, to look holistically. Um, and so that we don't have a proposal by proposal. So um, I'll just make off some of these points here, but really what I wanted to think about is how we can um, recalibrate um, the decision making so that you know the starting point is that this area should not be cleared and to shift the onus of justification onto the developer. In, in a way, you know, that's sort of maybe how that's supposed to work, but uh, the reality is is that there's a, the developers and the like think that they have an entitlement to clear vegetation. And we actually need to go to decision makers, well no, actually it's the other way around. They have the, uh, they have the onus um, and they've got to justify the loss of that native vegetation. Um, and so where we can strengthen those provisions, extend them, talk about those, some of those values um, and the many values of local bushland and have these arguments about value but from a proper starting point. Uh, not a sense of entitlement to clear native vegetation, but actually no is the starting point, and then um, how are you going to justify that? And I think perhaps even changing that further into the future. So, you know, the Schedule 5 principles, um, we'd like to change the statutory texts, but one thing we could change is to actually look at the, um, the interpretation that DWA has, so 2014 document, how can we get that stronger? How can we get changes into there? Um, and really talking about one of the things that's in the uh, section 4a it talks about the proper valuation of assets and services well what is local bushland but an asset and a service it provides ecosystem service to us it's an asset to us and we need to get that into our decision making so these are important points um, I won't go through this but this is just an example of the kind of information and what I really want to say is we have deforestation going on <coughs> Um, so there's a link to this article in a moment. Many of you are very familiar with the experience of Chua. But, you know, fundamentally, the, Bankshire, uh, the Swan Coastal Plain, Bankshire Woodlands and Chua Woodlands, um, they are nationally threatened, threatened ecological communities. They are disappearing rapidly. They are feeling the effects of climate change. We're going to lose much of them um, in the next couple of decades if we don't change around what we do. So there's an urgency to what we do and to get that into decision making. Um, and, you know, in looking around and trying where we can find good decision making, because sometimes lawyers and academics talk about, you know, um, law and the kind of thing, um, but I think we also need to look around for good decision making. So these are some examples where I think the State Administrative Tribunal um, has engaged in a planning context, um, but has engaged in some good decision making. Um, so the first one there, there's some really good stuff of talking about the, the Chewart Tech um, and its actual application to a particular um, development application, um, and there's others in the other two there. Um, and it's just a way of beginning to talk about um, how we can get better decision making. They're not perfect decisions from an environmental perspective, and that's not the that's not the job of SAT. They're not a they're not a uh, environmental review court, um, but you know they function and they do gauge in decision making. And there's some really good principles and ideas that come out of uh, SAT as well. So um, worth a look. Um, almost done, Christine. Um, and then we have a presumption against deforestation. So um, the point basically here is that we need to talk about uh, what it is and that we have deforestation. And, you know, we use a clearing, but clearing is a euphemism. Um, it's actually quite an old concept um, and a dated one. And we need to say this is actually deforestation um, because where we get to, and you know, this loss of vegetation is by continuing to look at a proposal by proposal um, basis, and so that we actually need to turn things around um, and look holistically at a landscape scale. And so we have a presumption against deforestation that brings in that cumulative and holistic impact approach, so we can get that net gain landscape, and really to articulate that as a goal for the Swan Coastal Plain. Um, but thanks very much to the organizers. Thank you all for the amazing work you do, and. Um, Take care.